that way he managed to capture this fish. So Allah bless him, and may this be a gathering of hair and goodness. Amen. When deciding what to talk about, it's been a busy day today, um, I thought the couple of things which are occupying my mind at the moment I will share with you. One is the whole rationale why I've ended up in, uh, in London in the first place, and that was to visit the uh, local eternal gardens, uh, where I act as an Islamic advisor uh, to ensure that the practices uh, that take place within the cemetery are done according to the Sharia. So death is what I will talk about. But the other issue is in the topic I don't think will be too different to how what the Muslim community is facing here in London as the Muslim community is facing in Bradford and in other cities up and down this country. And that is, unfortunately, the structure and the makeup of what our families have now become. So with those two solar topics, I will aim, inshallah, to address those. And when I start, I will sort of finish. <coughs> we all know that our purpose of life is really to get through life. That is the purpose of life, is just to get through life. The purpose of life is not life itself. I know that might sound strange as a concept, but as a concept, the purpose of life is not life. The purpose of life is to make your way through it to actually reach the true life. That is what his purpose is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order for us to succeed, has placed certain matters within the Quran, within the Hadith, in order to enable us to get to the hereafter so that we can successfully complete this life, get through this life and reach where we need to reach. So when we are born, nobody is born as an individual. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to bring us into existence without the need of parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the power to use other methods of bringing humans into this world. Well, he doesn't. He structures and he brings every single one of us within a family. And there are numerous verses which the Hufas will remember. But one that comes to mind when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strongly is against this breakup of this structure. And also when he explains those people who are the Fusa, those people who have transgressed, he describes them as that they break that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered that should be joined. This comes under the broad description and understanding of Silat Rahim. The enjoining and the keeping of blood ties. Ensuring the family structure exists. So the question comes, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to ensure that this family structure exists? As I said to you, we always have to keep in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always told us to do something in order for us to get through this life and succeed in the hereafter. So when he forbids breaking something, then that's not necessarily for Allah's benefit, that is for our benefit. So we need to understand why he does that. But there's other narrations and other matters which need to be taken into consideration as well. We find from a hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam ala kullukum rahim wa kullukum mas'oolan an rahiyatihi that every single one of you is a shepherd and every single one of you will be asked regarding his responsibility. Now he mentions the army and he mentions the woman and he mentions the children but because we are amongst men I will mention the man's responsibility. Wa rajimu rahim ala ahli baytihi wa huwa mas'oolan anhum and the husband, the father, is responsible for the people in his house. And he will be asked regarding that. So many of us will say, oh, Muftar, it's okay, you sat there telling us, we all know this. If only our children would listen to us. We ensure, we tell our children that they can't do this, they shouldn't do that, they don't, we shouldn't do this, but they won't listen to us. And then we look for excuses. We will say, well, it's the country we live in, it's the schools they go to. 
In essence, what we're doing is we're shirking that responsibility which the Prophet Islam said directly to us that you will be asked regarding your responsibility. What we're being saying is, but it's not our responsibility because it's out of our control. And also we are easy and quick to stress to our children that you should respect me and your father. But the question has come is why is that even being raised? Because we find from another hadith which the Prophet said, Man lam yarham sabirina, wa yarif haqqa kabirina, falaysa minna. That that person who does not show mercy, love, and affection to our young, and does not recognize the rights of our elders, then they are not from amongst us. Now, in this narration, who does he address first? He address, addresses the elders first. He says, those who don't show respect, love and mercy to the young. Then he addresses the youth and says, and those who don't recognize the rights of the elders, then they are not from amongst us. So from that, we now, let's take a step back. Back to the first hadith that I mentioned. That we are supposed to be shepherds and our family is our flock. Now when you look at a shepherd, you will see that the shepherd's job is to make sure that the sheep eat, also to make sure that the sheep don't panic. Because when a flock panics, okay, it starts to run. It runs here, it runs there, it runs everywhere. The shepherd's also job is to make sure that they don't go too close to the edge of the cliff, the edge of the hill, into somebody else's land, so he would make sure of that. But notice the time if you ever see a shepherd shouting at a sheep, screaming at a sheep, striking a sheep with a stick, you would say, brother, what are you doing? That's an animal. How is he supposed to understand you when you're shouting, I scream, I whatever? You're supposed to do the sheep with some tenderness and some uh, using your intellect and using whatever tools you have around you to make sure that if the sheep don't even recognize that a wolf is coming. So they don't panic. This is how we are supposed to be looking at addressing this issue. As I said, that Bradford and London and in the cities we find ourselves, we're seeing this disconnection now between the young and between the elders. So we're seeing, for example, young ladies choosing a particular lifestyle. And when then she chooses that particular lifestyle, then the father will either disown that child, or worse still, the father will carry out an act which is something so bad against his own flesh, against his own blood, where he will try to either beat or kill her. These are things which are within our community. We can't stick our head in the sand and say this is not our problem. This is our problem. And when external communities step in to fix our problem, we say, what? Why don't you just leave us alone? Why don't they let us solve our problems? But that's our responsibility to solve our problems. If we're denying their problem in the first place, then we have an issue. Every other day you will hear that a young lad was either intoxicated, or nowadays with the balloons, or whatever else, and he crashes his car. Lone driver, as in lone car, with two, three people, young, 22, 21, 19, 18 year old, dead. Our children, not somebody else's children. And you'll see within our broader communities, whether it's the Hindu community, the Sikh community, or whatever, we don't see the same issues occurring there. We see them occurring in our own communities. So our job is to somehow navigate through this life to get through this life and ensuring that our children, ensuring that our wives are looked after in such a way that no harm comes to them. When there's enough food for four people and there's five in the house, the father should not eat. Not that the father should eat first, and then whatever is left can be shared between the wife and the children. How can you demand respect from your children when you're not teaching them respect? Respect comes from love. 
When you look at the Prophet والسلام, in his full life, all he did was love his Sahaba. All he did was to show express love to them. Why is it that they wanted to gather his saliva and use it for their purposes, for their barakah? Why is it that they wanted to take the water that he had still glistening off his body in order to take barakah from him? They loved him. They would take any opportunity to kiss his torso, his hands, his feet. What is this? This is love. How is it when a man describes looking at the face of the Prophet and looking at the moon and looking at the face of the Prophet and looking at the moon and saying, I found the face of the Prophet was more beautiful than the moon? What is this? How many times have you looked at a man in his face and felt that? How did he gain that respect? How did he gain that awe? How did he gain that love? And because of his practice, his wives also then emulated this. So when Aisha mentions that a woman comes with two young girls and she asks for food, and Aisha cannot find anything within the cupboards except one date, and he, she gives it to the mother, what does the mother do? Split it in half and give it to the two daughters. Where are all these traditions gone from our own families? Where is that love gone? As I said, it's easy for the man to be the tyrant in the house. He is physically bigger than everyone. He is stronger than everyone. And then he will always know the hadith. That if the Prophet ﷺ had given anybody a hukum to prostrate, then he would have given a hukum to you to prostrate to me. So know your place, woman. He will know that. He will know the salam all the way from him, all the way to the Prophet ﷺ. With his. But when it comes to his responsibilities, then all that will go out the window. How can our children show respect and have deep in awe in us and have love for us when this is our character and our behavior? Our children learn from us. The first ustad is not Mawlana Sahib. The first ustad is mother and father. So if there's certain characteristics in our children that we don't like, well, hey, let's take a look in a minute. Let's take a look in a minute because your children using foul language, they picked out from you. You see, a mother can say to a child, or a father can say to a child, but you shouldn't lie, don't lie, lie is a bad thing. And then the phone rings and the mother picks the phone up and she's talking to her sister. And her sister is saying to her, let's go to so-and-so place. And she says, oh, I'm not feeling well today. And the child is thinking, oh, is hey, mom is absolutely fine. Why is she saying to her sister, she's not feeling well, I don't get this. So the child will approach the mother and say, Mother, I don't get this. You told me not to lie, and now I just saw you lie. Shut up. Don't you dare answer me back. How rude are you? Do you not have respect? So the child learns. Now you can lie when you become an adult. You just can't lie when you're a child. When I have power, then I can do what I like. But when I'm under the power of somebody else, I have to do as I'm told. That's what we're teaching our children. So why do you think they can't wait to be 16? Why do you think they can't wait to be 18? Why do you think they can't wait to be 21? Because they want that power. They want to be able to lie and not get told off. They want to do the same things you want to do. You say to the child, you should go and recite at least one just of Quran every night. You haven't done your door properly. You haven't done your hips properly. And then we haven't touched the Muslim since last one. Wow. What are you teaching your child? You're teaching your child hypocrisy. Now this is about power. When you get in a position of power, you hold other people accountable. Or when yourself you're not in power, you can do as you choose. Love is essential. We don't mention this enough in our deen. We hear from our Christian brethren that all these people is Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you. And they always say, why don't you ever say that? Doesn't Muhammad love you? And it's our problem that we don't know our Prophet it's our problem that we don't know our deen, that we need to express love to our children first. The Prophet sees his grandchildren, he kisses them. A Sahabi says, what are you doing? He goes, I have 10 or so children, I don't kiss any single one of them. But he says, that person who does not show that uh, this is mercy which is shown, man, nam, yeah, nam, yeah, nam. that person who doesn't show mercy, no mercy will be shown. The Prophet will act as a horse 
and let Hassan and Hussein mount on his shoulders and he will go around the room. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But even the angel said, we cannot go beyond this point and he went beyond this point and here he is putting his grandchildren on his We know with, with Umar al how they used to pick her up last train. This was a love the Prophet I'm sure. That's why there were people willing to give their lives for him. There were people willing to give their lives and our children were blessed to us. Forget give their lives. You ask your child, would you give your life for me? He's looking at you. And yet this is something that's come from us. A piece of us. And that's how they feel about us. You ask a person, ask yourself. When was the last time you told your child, I love you? Be honest. When was the last time? When was the last time you affectionately smiled at your child? When was the last time you grabbed your child and held them? Could be the last night you did that. You could be standing over the grave tomorrow. Then you will have regret. And the question comes back again. That every single one of you will be judged according to, will be questioned regarding your responsibilities. So when we run a house, we run a house, are we the cause of the arguments or should we the ones who we mitigate arguments? So when a wife is, the mother is having an argument with her son, we need to come in there somehow to get calm, love again between mother and son. If two siblings, two children are arguing with each other, we need to come in there somehow and bring that person again. The main job of the father is to make sure he manages his house with no arguments, no fighting. If there are arguments and fighting going on in the house, then the man needs to take that responsibility. If Allah subhanahu has given you the ability to divorce and he's not given the ability to the woman, if Allah subhanahu has given you the chance to take two shares of milah and yet the woman takes one share, and the fact that we give ourselves a little bit pat on the back that all we're men, with all these rights come responsibilities. Allah subhanahu has only given you these rights because he put more responsibilities on you. He's put less responsibilities on the wife. He's put less responsibilities on the mother. So he does not need to give her more. When you look within your own structures of your employment or wherever you are, you will see that the person at the top has more rights. Can you sack the CEO? I don't think so. Can the CEO sack you? Yeah. Do you go to the CEO and say, okay, tell me what you've been doing today? Or the CEO come to you and say, right, okay, what have you been doing today? See where the accountability is. But who doesn't sleep at night? Who is worried about how successful the business is going to be? Who is worried about where the money is going to come from? The CEO, what are we doing? Well, not my problem, it's the CEO's problem. He gets paid for that. So who should be at night worried about how his house is? The wife, the children, or the father? Who should be on the musalla crying when there's problems in his house? The mother or the children? The father. It's his responsibility. If your house is in on fire, don't blame anybody but yourself. Because if your house was successful, you would say, down to me. My children are good because of me. My children are pious because of me. My children go to the masjid because of me. This is our responsibility. This is what we need to do. I highlight it, whether it's young girls, unfortunately, who are looking for, you know, they find somebody online, some random guy. He just says nice things about her, she just goes head over heels in love with him. Why? Because she's never heard anybody say nice things to her. This is the first time she's hearing somebody say nice things to her. Her mother's always saying, oh, you're useless, your cousin is much better than you, your face looks like this, you can't even read properly, you can't even cook any food, people laugh at you, you're undermining her, you're taking her self-esteem away from her, you're taking her self-respect away from her. Some random guy comes on and says, nice to you, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, that's it, your daughter's done. Now you can be some superhero and take matters into your own hand and destroy your artwork. Or we can do what most people do is blame everybody else but yourself, even though you are in the most powerful position over that young lady. Same with the young lads. Why is it the young lads feel that the boys are their family? Why do the young lads don't feel that their family is their family? 
Why do young boys get respect on the street but they don't get respect in their own house? Why is it that you guys feel that the only way they're going to gain respect is to get respect from the family of the street and the only way you're going to get respect from the family of the street is if you do crime, if you get caught, if you're speeding, if you're taking drugs, if you're doing this and that's their, that's their grace. But if the father sat with his son, showed him love, valued him, gave him self-esteem, he wouldn't need to go outside looking for that. He wouldn't need to go anywhere else. That again is our responsibility. And whatever we say in this world, we can stick our head in the sand all day long. This we are responsible for, and we will be questioned on the day of judgment. Let us not shy away from that. Let's not shy away from that. So this message, my dear brothers, I'm talking to myself as a father. I'm talking to myself as a husband. This is a responsibility on me, and we should take running of the house as one of the most important things, more important than your work, more important than anything else. Running of the house is more important. We spend all day and night working. And then we turn it on the kids and the family, I'm doing this for you. They don't need you working 24-7. They need you at home. They need you to spend time with them. Or is it that we prefer chilling out with the boys? And then we're telling them, what son, don't go chilling out with the boys. You should be at home with your family. Or I'm off. Is this level of hypocrisy that we need to remove away from ourselves? Is this understanding? Many people say, no, but I tell him about praying salah, I tell him about this, I tell him about that. That's fine, that's instruction. But how many times do you tell a sheep, look, sheep, don't go there? Sheep, I'm talking to you. I said, don't go there. Do you understand what I'm saying, sheep? Bah. Okay, two minutes there, where's the sheep? He's gone over there. That's what happens. If you look at every single Nabi, they were shepherds. What were they being taught? Our own messenger, Ali Islam, was a shepherd. What were they being taught? The humans will be like this. Human behavior is like this. You have to keep patience. You've got to keep trying, you've got to keep trying, you've got to keep trying, because this is the nature of the human. This is the fifth of the human. And your responsibility is to keep that flock. If the family is collapsing, remember, you are responsible. Not the wife, not the children, you. You've got to find a way to bring everybody together. How you do that, that's your responsibility. And then forget going beyond. I've not even talked about cousins and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunties. We keep hearing the same story, don't we? Or, you know, it was like back in the day. And I've said this story myself. You know, we should all play together in the street. Doesn't matter what colour you were, doesn't matter how you practice your being, we all go together and then we pop into Auntie's house. We didn't know Auntie, she just called us in, we'd have tea at her house and then you know we'd go out. The front doors used to just be open. You hear these stories, don't you? People have changed. So how come everybody says it that people have changed? So who's changed if everybody's saying it? Everybody's saying it. And they keep saying, people have changed. So I say, you say, he said, he said, he said. So who's changed? We've changed. Don't make sense, does it? It can't make sense. No, they're not going anywhere. We've changed. We're the same people. But we've got into this habit, don't we, that because we, it's, we see people not doing this, we think, why should I do for? My brother didn't invite me to his son's wedding. Why should I invite him to my wedding? That's my son's wedding. Oh, she's not getting my choice. So, we are doing it. Why are we answering a bad with a bad? A person who does a love as we call it, he's not keeping good ties. This is not keeping good ties. Keeping good ties is somebody does something which is breaking the tie and you find a way to re-maintain that tie. You will get agile for it. Your relationship is with Allah. Allah has given you the hukum to do this. You're not doing anything for this person. This person you're only keeping with is because Allah has called for you to keep with this person. So there's no embarrassment in this. There's no ridicule in it. There's no disrespect in it. No, we've given ourselves this really big ego boost, haven't we? That this is disrespectful, you know. 
So many things we've made, this is disrespectful. Yes, sir, Omar ibn Khattab, then, who went around asking if somebody was to marry his daughter, Hafsa Ali Omar. And we would say, this is disrespectful. People should come and ask for my daughter, why should I go say that my daughter is available for marriage? Respect and disrespect is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you respect and it's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to debase you. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to debase you, you can think of yourself whatever you like. It does not matter, He will debase you. But if you humble yourself and you carry on with what you're doing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you Izzah. That's what's happened. Our connection with reality has changed. We become blinded by what we see in front of us, so we think my actions are what are making things happen. Not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making these things happen, and my relationship is with Allah. So when he has put this family around us, he's put this blood tie around us, he's joined us together, then we have to somehow maintain that one way or the other. Some have said the Musa, that's easy saying, but sometimes people can be very aggressive. A brother or sister could attempt to attack me. Okay, the people have gone as far as that. People have tried to, you know, defraud me, take my money away from me. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to continuously maintain ties with them? How am I supposed to maintain ties with them when I go to the house and he punches me in the face? So then in those circumstances, you still cannot break the tie. But what you do is you keep that level of distance. So at least you're protecting yourself from harm. Well, you cannot say that I'm now going to break with this person. We see that many a times again. A father is close to death, a mother is close to death, and they want to say, I don't want any of my jadal, I don't want any of my tariqah going to that particular son or that particular daughter. They didn't do anything for me in my life. You may do as you please with your man whilst you are alive, but as soon as you pass, that man is no longer yours. Allah subhanahu is giving you a direct hukum as to the rights of that man and it belongs to all your children because just because your child is back to you, Allah subhanahu wa made that child your child. He linked the blood between that person and you. You didn't do that. Friends you can pick, but blood ties you cannot. Even though now, you see, we've also gone to that kind of relationship where our you know, very close relationship is now between, say, the husband and wife. But even that relationship can break. But there is no such thing as talaq between a father and his son. There is no such thing as talaq between a brother and a sister. Yet talaq exists between the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman. But it doesn't exist between brothers and between two sisters, between a father and his grandson or whatever. It doesn't exist. Why is Allah not allowed that? If he's allowed the lot to exist between a husband and wife, why did he not allow the lot to exist between siblings or mothers? Because this is something he has commanded that these are the ones, because I have said all this. This is something that I have commanded. You can't choose that. The choice I'm giving you is with your wife. But I'm not giving you that choice with your children. I'm not giving you that choice with your parents. I'm not giving you that choice with anyone else. So there are, and there are many like-minded people out there. You see, for example, let's just say you're having your son get married or your daughter get married, and you meet a family, and if you're good, if you're decent, if you're fair, if you're a nice person, then you'll see that they will perpetuate that. Well, you take the lead. You take that lead, because that's where you'll start to see change taking place. That's where you'll start to see people acting according to what they're supposed to act by. So really that's the essence of what I want to talk about. But I want to finish where I started. And where I started was my purpose for coming here, which was death. Because when we look at the reality of all this, then it is death that we will taste. It is death that we will go to. That is where our final abode will be. Currently we might be looking for a new house, we might be finding a way to decorate our current house. We may be looking at building an extension. We may be looking at, looking at building a conservatory. But that house that you're going to spend the rest of your life in, you've not even looked at whether what's the, are you going to have a conservatory there in the grave? Are you going to have these things there? The only things that are going to build up for you there is your Ahmad. And if your kids do not want to see your face when you're alive, you think your kids are going to cry over your grave. 
you think your kids are going to do some kajari for you. So these were your some kajari, your children, and they themselves have no love for you. They don't want to know you. That's not the way we were taught. To this day, when we see that the Prophet Islam was, was ridiculed by the uh, Quraysh, that you know you're going to have no male child that's going to be left after you. You know, Abta, you're going to become somebody who has no lineage. Yet look, virtually every single male child will have Muhammad somewhere in his name. Why? Because he loved his Ummah, he was crying for you before you were even born. His feet were swelling for you before you were even born. We know a mother makes lots of sacrifices for her child. That's a favorite thing. But the Prophet did that out of choice for you. We spend thousands of pounds just to go to stand in front of him, just to give the route to him. Even though we know we can do that from here and it will be transported to him, we spend thousands just to go across there just to be in his presence. Why? Because you are good for him. When you find people speaking ill of him, writing against him, ridiculing him, it makes our blood boil. This is sign of Iman. Obviously, we're not stupid to carry out silly acts, but there's nothing wrong with feeling that pain in your heart. There's nothing wrong with your blood boiling. This is a sign that at least there's some Iman still left in us. But there's a little stir inside of us. Our children should feel like that about us. When somebody mentions his father, he should feel that inside him and don't speak about my father. Well, how is that going to come? That is going to come with, through our education, but not through sitting them down and waving our finger at them or sending to them, telling them to a Dalum or sending them to a Don't get me wrong, that will benefit the brother. Because obviously he's sitting amongst, like Muhammad has said, he's sitting amongst the Salihin, he's sitting amongst the Ulama, and these individuals will remind us of Allah. But when it comes to the nurturing, when it comes to the tarbiyah, that is the responsibility of the father to provide that. So that that love grows inside him. So he looks and he thinks, how much sacrifice has my father's made for me? What things my father's done for me? And no matter what I do, I do wrong after wrong after wrong. He just smiles at me. He advises me. He encourages me. And when the time is right, he tells me off. That look, you shouldn't have done that. I told you not to do this. You did this a lot of situations you found. Hey, you've learned your lesson, let's move on. Not that he doesn't talk to you for six days, frowns at you every time you walk past his room, shouts abuse at you, tries to take a swing at you. His many fathers said to me, oh, uh, deep thing happened, my son took a swing at me. Right? So I always say, did you ever take a swing at your son? Yeah, yeah, loads of times. I'm thinking, what about them? Of course, he'll be thinking inside of him now, where till I go? Where till I become your height? Where till I become your size? I'm going to swing at you. And then he say, you've got no respect. Well, he could easily turn and say, you've got no love. You've got no love. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about an extreme position to take that, let your child do what they like. That's not what I'm saying. But when people will sacrifice their life for someone when they have some, uh, you know what we say? All relationships, you need to make sure that you invest in your relationships. What we mean by that is when they are small and they are growing, you invest into them. You show them love, you show them affection, you're investing into them. So when the time comes that you need to draw some money from the account, your investment account, they will gladly do that. You don't even need to ask them. When they know that the father is not eaten, they themselves will go and get you food and put it for you. They themselves will do that. You won't even need to tell them. And I know this exists. People might say, oh, you know, you're talking about days gone by. No, no, no. This exists in this day. I've seen it in my eyes. I've experienced it. It exists. But that's because that love was there. That care was there. That attention was there. Absolutely, we are in a situation which is challenging, don't get me wrong. Growing a rose in a place 
which is just nice soil, fertile soil, no weeds, nothing in there. That's easy. But we're growing roses amongst all sorts of rubbish, unfortunately. Put and the, it's taking their energy away. And they're getting distracted. But turning on your child is not going to help because there are so many other doors which are open for them. You know, many people say, yeah, but in Pakistan it was like this, in India it was like this, in Somalia it was like this, in Bangladesh it was like this, in Turkey. They're yeah, fine if you were in a village 50 years ago. That's how it worked. You were powerful. The tribal structure was such that your child had to listen to you whatever you did to him. There are many, many doors open here. Many, many doors open here. That same system doesn't exist here. So we have, that smart has to be that you cannot take the same approach that your father took or your grandfather took that worked in, you know, 1970s in uh, some village in Attack or something, but it don't work in Bradford or it don't work in London or Croydon or whatever, it don't work. You've seen it with your own eyes how many failures has happened because of that. We were mentioning earlier, you know, you look at the prisons, we're filling prisons up. You know, it's embarrassing. We were talking to some colleagues earlier that we as ambassadors of this faith, unfortunately, have failed. We have failed. Because we speak about our own body. We're not allowed to cremate our body when we die. What do we do? We bury. And if you look at the ayat, what is the ayat when we're putting the three handfuls down? What's the final part? Minha nukhrijukum taratun ukhra Just before that? Minha khalaqnakum Minha khalaqnakum what? Fiha nuhidukum Fiha nuhidukum That shows that we're not wasting even our body We're returning it back to where we took it from Your Prophet ﷺ said that when you're making wudu near a river then don't use excessive water that water is going back into that same river it is inf informing you do not use excessive water. If you look at our streets, water bottles everywhere, rubbish everywhere. Again, I was speaking to Asif in the car that people, when they would transact with Muslims, they would inform them that there's this thing wrong with my product, there's this thing wrong with my product, there's this thing wrong with my product. So no Muslim would say, what are you telling me on this one? I'm going to want a cheaper price, I'm not going to buy it. You're too honest. Why are you so honest? Listen, my faith tells me to be honest. Now you go to a Muslim brother, you're thinking, how is this guy going to do me over? How is he going to do me over? You know he's going to get done over, you've already made that over. You're just deciding, how is he going to do it? Why is that? Why is that? So these are the sorts of things that we as men, you know, we like the privileges. We like all the frills we get with being a man. You know, Alhamdulillah, we can pray 30, 31 days a month. Um, that's not quite the lunar calendar, obviously, before anybody picks me up on that. We can fast through the whole of Ramadan. A woman cannot fast through the whole of Ramadan. A woman can't pray every single month. Alhamdulillah, we have that blessing. Why well, are we looking at these as blessings? And these are the changes that we need to bring in ourselves. And once we bring those changes in ourselves, you will see, inshallah, the changes and the fruits that you will grow in your gardens. How your children will accept that. And even if your child makes a mistake, and your child will, then do not be the one who slams the door in their face. Don't forget they're still your child. However they are, they might be 19, they might be 20, 21, they made a big mistake. You might think that, oh, shame on me. They're still your blood. Don't go because the world out there will swallow them up to such an extent they will be destroyed and they will lose their iman and you will be questioned for that. If you want to be forgiven by Allah, if you want Allah to forgive you, then you have to demonstrate forgiveness yourself. Be in a situation where people point to you and laugh at you that you know what this brother's son did, you know what this brother's daughter do. I will keep your child with you. 
your child is far more beneficial and better for you than having Izzat in the eyes of this person or Izzat in the eyes of that person. Respect in the eyes of this person or respect in the eyes of that person. I already told you, respect is what Allah gives you. Now, a very same person might be beating you today, now, a very same person will be talking, your back, talking behind your back tomorrow. This is not what we were sent here for. We were sent here for to make sure that we get through this life and we reach the next life. So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all strength and give us conviction and give us the ability, the sense, and the wisdom to raise our children with love. To show them that our houses will always be sanctuaries for them. There will always be a place of safety for them. And there will always be a place that they will be welcome. Amen.